From coast to coast, live via satellite, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord covers the major Christian events in America and across the world, reaching over 500 million souls with the good news of new life in Jesus Christ. Now, from Southern California, we invite you to be a part of the world's largest prayer gathering. Before all nature rises up to shine, shine. on Praise the Lord are Dr. E.V. Hill, ministering in music, David Sam, and ready to take your call, some of the most beautiful prayer partners in the world. Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul and Jan Crowd. Welcome, 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 everybody from coast to coast. Let's keep on praising the Lord. In fact, let's all just stand together and give Jesus a great big standing ovation. Shall we do that? As we open this program nationwide. Miami, you join in. New York, Oklahoma City, Phoenix, Denver. My goodness, our beautiful new sister station in Richmond, Indiana. From coast to coast, we're just going to keep on praising the Lord. Now, let me just have you do one more thing. We do this when we go out to places like Phoenix and when we go, let's do it at home. Turn to your neighbor there and get acquainted and introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Jen Crouch. I'm Paul Crouch. Yes, How so are you nice tonight? To it's meet wonderful you. to meet You're you. You're gorgeous. Yes. Are you married? Yes, I You're am. You're married. I am already taken. Yes, yes. Thank <laughs> oh, you very right. much. <laughs> and uh, why don't you speak to somebody there at home, maybe that you haven't <laughs> spoken to for a long time? <laughs> and uh, let's join together and unite as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. While you're still standing, take someone by the hand. Let's just invite the precious Holy Spirit to come right Hallelujah. now and pervade this place. I walked into the green room a little while ago and David Sapp has already started praying the glory down in this place. Come on over here, Dave. Let's welcome David Sapp from Modesto, California. I'll give him a proper introduction in just a little bit. How you doing, brother? Good to be here. I feel the presence of the Lord. I mean, the Lord is moving. God's going to do something wonderful here. In fact, why don't you just lead us in our opening prayer and let's do invite the precious Holy Spirit to just come and do whatever He wants to do tonight. Father, we praise you today for this opportunity to just lift your name and to praise you. You said if you'd be lifted up, we would, that you would draw all men unto you. In the beginning of this, in the outset, in the beginning of this program, we begin to lift up the name of Jesus. And we praise the holy name. And we believe that during the next few moments, in the next few uh, hours, however long this program goes tonight, we're going to believe you for miracles. We're going to believe you for the Holy Spirit to be outpoured in homes and families and hurting situations situations in the prison ministry all across America, everywhere this program reaches, that the power of the Holy Spirit would come down and set people free. We thank you now that we can celebrate this freedom in our hearts, and we worship you and praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you for it. Let's just thank him for it. Hallelujah. Just in your own way there, just lift your hands, even there at home or in that prison cell or wherever you are. In that freedom. hospital room, freedom let's praise the Lord. Thank Father, we praise you. you. We thank, thank you for Jesus. We thank, thank you that our spirits are free. And even those that may be incarcerated in man-made prisons, they're free for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, we praise you. We just praise you and praise you and praise you and praise you. Praise you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all the body of Jesus Christ across America said, Amen. 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 David, get ready to sing a song for us. Jan's got a letter to share. And um, uh, Tom, can you get a picture uh, of my beautiful phone counselors over here? 
beautiful prayer partners. In fact, Mr. B Director, as we open every night, I want you to get a picture of them. Mm -hmm. When we say, waiting to take your call, some of the most beautiful prayer partners in the world, there they are. Mm -hmm. And they love Jesus enough to come down and give their time, not only here in California, but in all of our stations now. We mm -hmm. have uh, prayer partner counseling centers where beautiful people of God come down and give their time just because they love you and want to pray for you and read the word to you and be your friend and just be your prayer partner. So that number on the screen is for you to call if you need just a friend or someone to pray with you yes. or to lead you to Jesus or whatever your need. Maybe you're suffering. Maybe you're in fear. Maybe you're in depression. Maybe whatever. Amen. Our God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's lots of riches. Yes. Oh, my. You know, no. we've applied that to just financial oh or monetary. No, no, no. no. Mm. My God shall supply whatever yeah. your need may be yeah. according no. to his riches in glory by Amen. Christ Jesus. Praise. Ooh. I feel Ooh, good I feel about good. that. I feel good. You know, let me read this one little letter. It's just going to, it'll thrill, Dave. It's just beautiful. And you spoke and about day. Richmond. And it's from a child, which just makes it really special. And if you could show the pictures while I read I'll it, it would it be so up sweet. real close. This is from Darlene Patrick from Fairfield, Ohio. It says, Dear Paul and Jan, praise the Lord. I am praising God for the healing of my little daughter, Carrie Elizabeth. We were watching Praise the Lord the Night Evangelist, <laughs> T.L. Osborne, yes, was is. speaking so wonderfully on faith is an act. Carrie's eyes were very badly swollen and red with infection. She woke up that morning and couldn't get her little eyes open until I put a warm cloth on them. I made an appointment for her to see a doctor the next day. As we were watching, I heard my little girl say, There's Jan and Paul. Now she's only two years old, but she loves to watch Jan and Paul. Then I heard her say, What you doing, Paul? Then seemingly, Paul answered her as he said, Right now we're getting ready to pray for the sick. The, then he instructed the people to lay their hands on the place that they hurt and pray along with him. I looked over at my little Carrie, and she was placing her little hands <laughs> on those little swollen eyes. And her sore eyes, which had given her so much pain that day. Then she began to raise her little tiny arms in praise to Jesus. And said she kept doing this throughout the whole program. The next morning, her eyes were healed. <laughs> and she didn't even have to go to the doctor. She'd slept through the night, unlike the night before. Her eyes were no longer swollen, the red inside. She had no trouble opening them when she awoke. Thank God for Christian television and the miracle that it comes into our home. Thank you, God, for healing little Carrie's eyes. My husband, Reverend Millard, Oh, Patrick and I watch Channel 43 all the time. So our little children, Sean, six, and Carrie Elizabeth, two. I took them to see you, Paul and Jan, when you were at the Tri-County Assembly of God. They were so excited. We love you. Sincerely, Darlene Patrick from Fairfield, Ohio. And there's little Carrie there's one little more time. Yes. And... If I can get the front page, little there's little brother Sean. Sean. We got a picture of both of them. Isn't that incredible? Thank you for sharing that beautiful testimony oh. to Mother Darlene Amen. Patrick from Fairfield, Ohio. I'll tell you, it's <laughs> testimonies like that that keep <laughs> this old German going sometimes <laughs> when it gets a little rough. Oh. <laughs> but I appreciate that testimony, and I know it'll cause faith to rise in someone else's heart. It does not. <laughs> oh, the faith of a little child is so pure and so precious and so like 
like God, yes. you know, yes. so perfect. And uh, I am not at all surprised that no. <laughs> Jesus touched that little angel and healed those eyes. I remember when we were going through so much trouble with the New York station, and I asked the children yes. to pray with us. <clears throat> and I believe in heaven when we really get to see the replay of how that whole mm. miracle happened, mm -hmm. it's going to be some little child's prayer. I've got in my office sure the picture thing. of the little boy with Jesus' hands and the tears running down Jesus' face because TVN wasn't on in New York at that time. And I know that that little boy was praying for New York. And you know, I love it. But the beautiful thing is, we can become as little children. Oh. All we have to do is ask Jesus to cleanse us and, and make us whole. We do become. That's it. We won't enter the kingdom of heaven unless we do become as there little children. And that gives us all hope. Yes. All of us can ask Jesus. We don't have to, it doesn't have to be our intellect. It nope. doesn't have to be Thank our God. good works. <laughs> <laughs> it can just be, Jesus, forgive me, cleanse my heart, Amen. and then ask him what we need. And he'll do it every time. <laughs> oh, we have so much to share with you tonight. We're going to send Jan back to prison what a joy. again in what just a, a little joy. bit. Yes, yes we're going to go back to the prison. Jan has some very exciting things to share with you in just a little bit. Let me say this quickly, too, that at the conclusion of Dr. Hill's message tonight, we're all going to celebrate Holy Communion together. So just, you know, we've, we've sort of neglected this on the air. I know many of you do it regularly either in your homes or in your churches thank God for that but here on TBN we just felt the need to draw nearer to the Lord today and to just remember his death and then of course his glorious and blessed resurrection so whatever your custom is begin to prepare the elements there in your home now many of you have the little Holy Land communion sets that we've sent to you get them out get them a ready and whatever your custom may be the juice or the wine the bread whatever we're going to celebrate the table of the Lord together um, in an hour or two whenever Dr. Hill finishes his ministry here with us tonight uh, before we go to the prison uh, David Sapp is here to sing and minister to us and are we going to have some wonderful ministry in song tonight David is a songwriter vocalist he's a preacher too he, the preach may come on him a little tonight if it does go after it Dave uh, from Modesto California he's been singing since the age of five years of age and has been in full-time ministry since age 13 uh, can you believe that uh, David has recorded three record albums his latest one keep on believing he travels throughout the United States and many countries overseas holding revival crusades. Let's welcome him with all our hearts Author tonight. Of there is a river. There is Jimmy a river Swaggart. that Jimmy Swaggart sang and David sings and we sing. Maybe he'll sing it for us again tonight. We love it so very much. Give him a great big old Southern California welcome tonight. Evangelist David Sapp. Some that morning we shall see Jesus in the air Coming after you and me, joys of him to share Now what rejoicing that will be when the saints arise Headed for that jubilee yonder in the sky Oh, what a singing, oh, what shouting Oh, what a happy morning when we all shall arise Oh, what the glory, glory, hallelujah when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. Seems that now I almost see all the sainted dead rising for that jubilee that is just ahead. Now in the twinkling of an eye, changed with them to be all the living saints to fly to that jubilee. Oh, what a singing, oh, what shouting on oh, that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what the glory, glory, hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. Now when with all the heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost. How 
how the heavens ring. Millions there will join the song and change with them to be. Praising God through ages long, heaven's jubilee. Oh, what the singing, oh, what the shouting on oh, that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what the glory, glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. We're going to have lots more good singing. In fact, he has another song coming up in just a moment, but before he sings it, and a special dedication he'd like to make, Jan's got, what, another little letter, and then I want you to kind of set up for us what we're going to be seeing All right. before we go to the prison. You know, the Lord has given me, ever since I was... Even a teenager, you worked prison ministries when you were in Bible school, yes. and and uh, I did when my dad pastored the big church in Columbus, Georgia. We had prison ministries into the old folks' home, and those were my two favorite. I loved to go to the old folks' home, and I loved to go to the prison ministries, and uh, we'd sing and praise and preach. I've, yes, and and I've just always loved to go because you know, but for the grace of God. Any of us could have been in prison had we gotten started on the wrong road. And we're going to hear a testimony tonight from a young man who was brought up in the church. Mm. Oh, my. Knew how to pray for the sick and everything else. But ended up being Sneaky Pete, killer of many people mm. and in the Florence, Arizona prison. But I received this letter that you haven't even heard today. And this is kind of what is on my heart and what has kind of led me to go into the prisons and get the testimonies from the young men. Listen to this one. Dear Sis, I received your letter today along with the free lesson. That's the National Correspondence Institute lesson. Now this is from a prisoner. From a prisoner. Mm -hmm. As you know, my name is Bruce, and I won't give his last name until we can get permission from the prison to do that, but I do have it. <clears throat> but what you may not know is that I'm in the state pen here in Huntsville, Texas. I've been in here for three months. I've been in lockup for almost three years. Sis, I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I received two life sentences and the death penalty while in Fort Worth, Texas. I am scheduled to be executed sometime in December of this year. And I'm 22 years of age. Jesus. Sis, I do have a very earnest desire of experiencing the life-changing effect of knowing the good Lord personally. So I did study the lesson number one to the utmost, and I'm receive, waiting to receive number two, so please send it. If I can receive any personal help, thank you for it. Yours truly, Bruce from Huntsville, Texas. Mm -hmm. I will do everything I can to get into the prison at Huntsville, Texas to meet personally with Bruce and to tell him about Jesus. This is the kind of letters we receive because Trinity Broadcasting Network, because of you, is going into the prisons around America. I receive letters constantly from Susan Adkins, my beautiful sister in the Lord, yes. Chino Prison. Many of you know her from the Manson story. I receive letters from Florence, Arizona. We receive them from Oklahoma, from Juneau, Alaska, from all of the prisons. Well, I received one the other day from a young man named Lee McVeigh, who said, I watch you and I want to back up what you're saying and your son is saying about rock music because I personally have killed over 14 people and as 
I traced back my life during the killings, I realized I was listening to the same rock song as six of them were killed. Mm. Laverne Tripp and I went to the prison and Matthew, my son, in Florence, Arizona, and we have this roll-in right now with Lee McVeigh. Lee was not a Christian when we walked into the prison, but with the help of God <laughs> and with the help of Laverne and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ himself walking right into the room with us, we were able to minister to this young man. Young man. And I want everyone to hear what he says. And as we come back from the testimony, I'm going to explain some beautiful things that happened that we didn't get on tape, but next time we will. This is a young man. Named the other day, my secretary handed me a letter from a young man at the Arizona State Prison. And as I read it, my heart was touched very deeply, and I read it on the air. And Laverne and I have come to the Arizona State Prison to meet Lee McVeigh. And I'm going to read just a portion of his letter. I committed 14 killings in three different states and on six separate occasions in different locations, the same song by the same group off the same album was playing when each of these six killings occurred. I also want to read another paragraph. It says, on a lighter note, as I told you, I am not presently a Christian, but would very much like to meet and correspond with someone who is. Well, Laverne Tripp and I have come all the way to Florence, Arizona prison to just talk to Lee today. We've talked to him for quite a while, learned a lot about his life. But something that he told us just a while ago touched me, Lee, and I thank you for it. He said that there's two channels that he can get on his television in his cell, and that one of them is, what you get, skin flick? Skin movies. Skin movies. And the other is Channel 21. And he finds himself watching Channel 21 now more than he watches the other channel. And he doesn't really understand what's going on. And he said that the other night when Laverne Tripp was on preaching, that for the first time in a long, 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 long time, he found himself crying. Laverne, I just would like for you to maybe talk to Leah. Well, Jan, I... First of all, I'm just so thankful, and Lee, as I sit here and look at you, I know that but for the grace of God and His mercy, I'd be behind these bars. But there are many people that are in a prison, being locked up physically, it's even worse being locked up spiritually. To be free, free from all guilt and all condemnation and, and the burdens and pressures that Satan will put on you, and I know that you know that. But I thank God His Spirit is touching you, and it's happening through Christian television, and it's good to meet you. We're glad to, glad to see you. How long have you been in? Well, this time I've been in since uh, 1978. Okay, you have talked to us quite a bit about your life. Just tell the people out there, what happened to you as a young man? Well, I don't really know how far back to start, but uh, I grew up in a portion of society, I guess you call them street people, but uh, I started doing hard drugs when I was 11 years old, I started shooting heroin, and then uh, a year later I started going to Youth Authority in California, that's for juvenile offenders, and uh, I've been in and out all my life. Uh, I haven't had any boundaries that uh, I guess you say normal people do. Uh, the only uh, set of standards I had was what I had physically, uh, how much money I had, uh, whatever, and then uh, just, I don't really know what portion of it to tell you, you know. Uh, your arms and uh, your body being tattooed, you told us that you had actually gotten involved with a girl who was a devil worshiper? Yes, well, I was uh, 
I guess you call it socially retarded. I was on the streets so little that, uh, well, I've only been on the streets a little over two years since I was 12 years old, and I'm 33 now. The rest of the time I've been locked up. And uh, I came out once, and uh, I got hooked up with a real pretty girl. I thought she was real pretty. Physically, she was real pretty. And uh, things started coming. I uh, acquired a lot of money, and uh, I was sitting in my house in my early teens in a five-bedroom house that I paid cash for. I had $100,000 in cash and two pounds of methadrine. And about four hours later, I went upstairs and cut my wrist. And uh, I had all the things that I thought I wanted. And later on, the same girl convinced me that uh, if I just hung in and kept living the way I was living, that I would continually gain more. And uh, I found out many years later, excuse me, that she was a priestess in a satanic church. And uh, that she, uh, she actually uh, recruited young men that were in a certain, certain portion of society into uh, a type of life, I guess, that would, would glorify Satan. I don't, you know, I never really thought about it in, in the sense of, uh, of her being a priestess or anything. I knew what she was doing, basically, but uh, I never called myself being involved. I was so void of emotion that uh, I didn't really have a good or bad. What made you cry the other night, Lee? I don't have the vaguest idea at all. What was Laverne saying? Uh, well, I, I don't know whether it was his honesty to touch me or what, but I'd like to go back a little bit and what I said. When I was 14 years old, a lot of you aren't going to like this too much. When I was 14 years old, I was dealing methadrine to four different preachers, and they were uh, buying the methadrine from me, even trading young women out of the congregation to me for drugs. So uh, that was my exposure to uh, Christianity. And, uh, and I, seen La I saw Laverne, and uh, he talked about coming to God and then going the same day to the connection and getting pills, or getting high at least, the same day or the next day, I don't remember which. And uh, that was real rare to me because I had all my visions of people who were preaching were Jim Jones-like, uh, doing it through uh, drugs. I believe in a minimal amount of reading and you get speeded up enough, you can, can reach people and make them think it's the, the spirit, as you, as you people call it, because you give off such an aura and, and take command of your conversation. But uh, I just, uh, that was the only exposure I had to uh, preachers. But you cried, did you? Yeah, it was the first time in my life, not a long, long time. First time uh, in your life? I have no, no, I have no rec uh, recollection of ever crying as an adult or a child. Well, Lee, I just want to tell you, the Spirit of the Lord was touching you, Laverne. <laughs> it's hard to know what to say, because like this, I know the answer. And I know that's Jesus talking to you. You know what, you know what it was to be phony, and you saw something that was real. And it's not that I'm anything special, but it's what he did for me. There cannot be a counterfeit unless there's a genuine. And I reached a point in my life, and I think you're, you're, you're right at it. You're right on that brink of saying, hey, there may not be anybody real, but I want to be real. I want to know the truth. I want to know what really the truth is. And you're seeking for it. Jesus said, I am the truth. Johnny Cash recorded the song some years ago. He said, what is truth? The Bible tells us what truth is. Jesus said, I am truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's no hype. That's no nut. That's just the way it is. And, and the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to your heart. That's, it's that simple. The change, you can't change yourself. You could, change, you could start trying to turn over a new leaf and doing different and being different here in the prison. But un, until you, all you've got to do, though, is just ask him. That's what he said. Let me, hand me that Bible that you had. I want to, to turn to something. I'm going to ask you to read something. Uh, I want you to read it for me. You'd rather me read it to you. And uh, because I, you're really special, and the Lord is speaking to you. And I want you to read what He has to say. Uh, this is the Book of Romans, the tenth chapter. And if you'll just read, starting the ninth verse. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath 
raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means you too. It's one thing to watch Channel 21. It's one thing for us to come here. But all this says that all you have to do is ask. And if you're willing to ask Jesus to come into your heart, he said he'd do it. And I would not do you, I'd be doing you an injustice if I didn't ask you if you'd like to pray now. If you'd like to pray now, Jan and I'll pray with you. That's God's promise to you. You can have this life. You can have it now. Will you pray with us? Let's pray this prayer together right now. Pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. I confess to you I failed. I confess to you I failed. I have sinned. I have sinned. And I know there's no hope. And I know there's no hope. Outside of you. Outside of you. I believe your word. I believe your word. I just read it. I just read it. And I believe that promise is for me. And I believe that promise is for me. I confess you now. I confess you now. As Lord of my life. As Lord of my life. I no longer will serve Satan. I no longer will serve Satan. But I serve Jesus. But I serve Jesus. I choose this day. I choose this day. To serve him. To serve him. Teach me your ways, Lord. Teach me your ways, Lord. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe you rose from the dead. To give me life. To give me life. I receive that life now. I receive that life now. Teach me your word. Teach me your word. Help me to understand it. Help me to understand it. I want my life to count for good. I want my life to count for good. So I commit it to you now. So I commit it to you now. And from this moment on. From this moment on, I will follow you. I will follow you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For saving my soul. For saving my soul. Now I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for Lee. I just plead the blood of Jesus right now to cover him. Lord, give him a knowledge and understanding of your word. And help him, Lord Jesus, to grow strong in faith and in courage praise you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit and for what we feel in this place today and for what you've done right now. Lord, I thank you that you bound up Satan. He tried to keep us from getting in here today and now we know why. I praise you because you are more powerful. I praise you for this miracle today. In Jesus' name, we claim total victory for Lee. Amen. <laughs> and the moment that Lee had prayed the sinner's prayer, I looked over at a fellow prisoner that was there named Keith, and I said, Lee, tell Keith what's just happened in your life. And he looked over there and he said, Keith, Jesus is Lord. Oh. <laughs> and he went, <laughs> oh, that's not the end of the story. He went, he went around to his captain who was sitting right around, of course, he's in maximum lock up. He's killed 14 people. He's in for all the life sentences you, that you can serve. And he looked around at captain. He said, Captain, Jesus is Lord. And his captain looked at him. And then John Wagner, who is our little resident minister down there, who is a prisoner, but is now waiting to get out just any day, said, Jan, I saw half-track today. That's what they call him, half-track. And he said, I want to tell you, it's real. He said, he oh. has changed from death to life, and he's a brand new creature in Jesus Christ. So that is what happened that day. What we saw then, and I didn't realize it at first because I thought, and this is the first I time I had to. seen the film. I might say that I was in, in Washington, Washington D.C. and didn't get to go with Matthew and Jan and, and Laverne down into the prison. I want to go sometime. I did go on a couple of occasions, but I, I didn't know until you really kind of got into it there that really Half Track didn't know Christ as he received the Lord then and there. Honey, as the you man prayed, had he? never been to church in his life. 
He had never prayed in his life. And he was 33 years old. And there we saw him on tape. And the message is written on his arms. I know the name of the rock song. I, I, I don't know the time that we will give it, but we will give it. I know the name of the rock song he told me that was playing. I just want to tell the young people that are watching, stay away from rock music. He told me, he said before, he said, there's something that would rise up in me. Hmm. And his eyes, you can see his eyes, demons, devils all over his arms, filthy words on him. But he said something would rise up in me when I would hear that rock music. We know what that is. Absolutely we know what it is. But to see his face, <laughs> people, I tell you, praying with a prisoner and seeing a life change like that, we just floated out of the prison. Just Laverne and Matthew and I were just, we were just floating as we went out seeing a life that was so torn and destroyed and lied to by Satan, completely changed before our eyes. And you know, one of our cameramen that went said, I don't know when I have felt the presence of Jesus like I felt inside that little room. Jesus Christ just walked in and took a sinner. And you know, the thing is, anyone that's broken one point of the law, you've broken them all. Yes. So Lee wasn't any worse off in Jesus' eyes than any of us. But now he's a brand new baby, just like all of us when we ask Jesus to come into our life. Glory. A brand new baby. Brand new. Sin gone. Sin gone. And you know, I think David has a song that he wants to dedicate to them. In fact, let's let David Sapp make this dedication. I think he wants to dedicate it to all of the prisoners who are watching tonight. In fact, after he sings, we're going back to prison, aren't no, we? No, Sneaky is out. Oh, he's out. Yes. But he is a former inmate. Yes. Sneaky Pete? Sneaky Pete. We're going to talk with Sneaky Pete. He, oh, I remember. He came to the yes. Channel 21 studio, didn't he? And you were able to interview him in the studio there. But we'll hear his testimony next. And um, Half track, Sneaky Pete. Who is the... Uh, and then Roman, of Roman, course. Roman, beautiful Stone. Roman. My, we're, we're just seeing God do some of the most oh, glorious miracle. things in the prisons. And you know, I, I know that Susan wouldn't mind me saying this, Susan Atkins. But a lot of us read 10 years ago, or maybe it's been a little more now, where she went through the problem with the Manson family. She found Jesus as her Savior. And a year ago or so ago, she went through quite a problem. And Paul wrote her a letter at the time and said, Susan, don't do it. Don't get involved. Yeah. Well, Susan went through a little troubled time in her life, but I got a call from her the other day. She had seen Roman Stone's testimony on Channel 40 that she watches here in the Chino prison. She said, Jan, I don't know when anything had touched me like mm. that. And said some words that Roman used and I didn't know what he was saying to the prisoners. I just said, talk to the guys. Let them know it's really real. And something he said, Susan said, Jan, those words that he used, the prisoners all know that it was real. It was real. And she said, you tell Paul for me that he was the only one that really loved me because when I was about to make that decision in my life, he wrote me and said, Susan, don't do it. And said, now I know that Paul really, really loves me because he went by the word and told me not to do it. Susan wants to give us another testimony and so we're working on that. But we, we hope to get out and visit with I believe Susan. every prisoner can be <coughs> set free Amen. with Jesus. Oh. Lee McVeigh half-track, he's no longer locked up. No. He's free in Jesus. Amen. He is a free man. Praise and I love it. Yeah. You know what thrills me is the fact that every one of you who love 
pray for, support, in any way lend your influence to Christian television, you're going into that prison. Mm -hmm. You were with mm -hmm. Jan right. and Laverne. Grandma, you may be 99 years old, but you are visiting the prison. We couldn't be you, there without yeah. the little dish, and that's what you that's paid right. for. And they're watching. Instead of the skin, what is it? Skin flicks. tights? Flick. Skin, skin tights. <laughs> I don't know what they that's, skin tights. Well, it's what it is, really. It's pornographic that's movies. That's what it is. <laughs> it's just rotten old porno, and I am they're shocked. They're watching Channel 21. I am really shocked that they would let that kind of stuff go into a prison. Well, I, praise God they let Channel 21 on. Amen. So if amen. they'll let that on and the guys are watching it, we At least God's it. getting equal, equal time, time, isn't he? <laughs> amen. All right. We're going to go back and hear another beautiful testimony from Sneaky Pete in just a little bit, but uh, David Sapp is here tonight, and David wanted to make a little dedication, I guess, to all of the prisoners who are watching wherever they may be tonight. David? Yes, I, I, I listened to this testimony, and I begin to realize, like when I got saved, I was six years old. Uh, nobody in town really knew it. Maybe a few people in church knew it. It didn't make the headlines. Nobody made a big deal about it. And the thing that happens around the world, people want to make the headlines. We see people walk into the uh, 17th floor of some bank building and begin to uh, shoot an automatic weapon, and just whoever's in the way gets shot and killed. And we begin to notice that people are just going off the deep end, uh, hoping to get their name in the headlines. When a soul gets saved, it doesn't do, it, you know, nobody really makes a, a big deal about it. But let me tell you what happens over in heaven. The Bible talks about a, a great celebration that goes on in heaven when a soul gets saved. And I believe the angels are rejoicing. They are singing glory, 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 and hallelujahs, and worshiping the Lord when, when all of these young people come to know Jesus. And wherever you are, in whatever prison facility you may be in, Jesus can unlock the door and give you freedom over all of the problems that you've had in the past, the many deep feelings that go way back into your childhood. Jesus can release you from that tonight. Right now, while we're singing this song about it making the headlines in heaven when I got saved, I believe Half Track can rejoice with this as well because his name is written all over heaven. It made news in heaven when I got saved. It didn't make the papers in this world when I prayed through. It didn't seem to matter to all but just a few. But in the golden streets of glory, celebration banners waved, and it made news in heaven. When I got saved, the angels were rejoicing, and the hallelujahs rang, cause Jesus touched my life, and I was changed. Everyone in glory's realm knew my name was written down. Not long ago, a beggar, but now I'm a child of the king. This old world just shrugged its shoulders. It didn't mean a thing. But listen, ah, oh, but it was God's approval that my spirit really craved, cause it made the head die. touched my life and I was changed everyone in 
I'll tell you where else it made news. It made news in hell. That's right. Boy, they know when they lose one, and they don't like it. It's bad news down there, but it's good news in heaven because there's rejoicing, the word says, before the very angels of heaven. I wonder if, when one soul I wonder if the angel had to kind of giggle when he's writing half track. <laughs> well, I have a feeling that the little recording angel probably writes their true and legal <laughs> names down when, you know. Sneaky Pete. You know, I doubt if there'll be any. I love it. He may put for oh, emphasis I Sneaky Pete. I, I don't know. How did we get into this? <laughs> Pamela just got saved in Marion, Indiana. And here is <laughs> Hannah from North Las Vegas, Nevada. Gloria from Phoenix, Arizona. Jean from Phoenix. Brenda from Glendale. Steve from Long Beach, California. Here's Pamela from Mary in Indiana again. Gloria from Phoenix. Oh, my goodness. They're coming in from all over Florida. Pompano. Denise from Pompano Beach, Florida. Harry from Fort Lauderdale. Faye from Miami. Garyan from Miami. Jerry from Carroll City. Betty from Homestead. Jean from Phoenix, Arizona. People of the whole world are getting saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> Pastor Hill, if you don't hurry up and preach, we may have them all saved before you even get to preach. Praise God. Well, I have a feeling there'll be a few left, oh. and it won't be long. Pastor E.V. Hill is here, and he'll be joining us in just a little bit to share with us and preach the Word, do whatever the Holy Spirit uh, instructs him to do, and then uh, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion together. So if you've joined us a little late, let me tell you again, prepare the elements there in your home or wherever you are, whatever your custom is, and we're going to break bread together and we're going to celebrate the table of the Lord, Holy Communion together at the conclusion of Pastor Hill's ministry. Well, tell us a little about Sneaky Pete. Young man walked into the studio when we were over in Phoenix for the um, revival. <coughs> he said, Jan, I just got out of Arizona prison. Had been out a while. He said, I was shot by one of the inmates down there. I was taken out of the prison as dead. Many of the prisoners who see this testimony will think he's been resurrected from the dead because most of them thought that he had been killed. He found Jesus Christ as his personal Savior through reading, of all things, my favorite scripture, because it's the one that I always sign when I sign Bibles or sign little notes for people. I always read 1 Corinthians 13. And this hardened prisoner, and let me give one little testimony. I'm not going to say who, I'm just going to say that it happened. Eight people came to sneaky sale to kill him before he was shot. Seven of them ended up in the hospital. One of them got away. <laughs> this is the gentleman that through God's grace and mercy and through his word has saved. I couldn't interview him one night and I asked him the next night, why didn't you come last night to be interviewed? He said, oh, that was my youth meeting. And he said, I had to meet with the young people that I meet with at my church. And he is now married and serving Jesus Christ as his Savior. But there's several things in this testimony I want you to note. The forgiveness in his heart for the one that shot him. The love that he has for the lady that prayed for him and gave him and made him read the Bible. That saved his life. And I want you to note another point of his testimony. That he served all of his life the one, and he didn't realize it, that he blamed 
See, he blamed, he, he, he was blaming God for taking the life of his grandfather. And he served the one that killed his grandfather. And he didn't realize what a mistake he was making. He served Satan. And so the testimony is self-explanatory. Jan and Sneaky Pete from the Channel 21 studio. All right, let's go to I Channel 21. I haven't seen 21. this myself. I haven't either. And see what Brother Sneaky. We're standing in the studios of beautiful Channel 21 here in Phoenix, Arizona. And I have with me a young man that only because of the grace of God, he isn't dead and in hell. And he will tell you his own story. He was known to you guys down in Florence, Arizona prison as Sneaky Pete. And we're going to find out why. But in 1971 and in 1975, Pete committed murder and was sentenced by the Arizona prison system to the Florence, Arizona prison. And there he was quite a booger in that prison down there, as some of you down there will know. But standing by me here is a brother that is changed by the power of Jesus Christ. And if any of you don't believe that Jesus Christ can make a brand new person out of somebody, I want you just to hear this testimony. Pete, what led you into a life of crime and being such a stinker? down in that Florence, Arizona prison. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I grew up in a church, and when I was young, I felt real close to the Lord. And uh, just a simple childlike faith, I, I didn't think there was anything that he wouldn't do or couldn't do. And when I was 10, my grandfather came down with leukemia, cirrhosis of the liver. And I was closer to him than I was to anybody else in the family. And I prayed long and hard. Of course, when you're nine or eight or nine years old, long and hard doesn't take very long to pray. He passed away. And I got mad at God. I got mad at my parents. I stayed mad for about 20 years. I guess about a year or a year and a half after that happened, I started drinking. I was 11 years old. And the, the anger didn't go away. It just escalated. And then when I was in high school, I started using drugs. And basically just ended up serving Satan. Pete, you told me this story the other night. And we're going to tell at the end of this interview about the love of Jesus Christ through forgiveness. But I want to make a point right here that I think is going to help a lot of people. See, Jesus didn't kill his grandfather, but Pete didn't know that, and he blamed God. But see how deceitful Satan is and how tricky. The one that killed his grandfather, Satan, is the one that Pete started serving. And boy, you served him well, didn't you? I did. Is drugs and alcohol just a real opening to violence? It seems to always be that way. That's it seemed like it was for me. I was a lot less inhibited whenever I was under the influence. I felt like I was a lot tougher, that I was, I was impervious to physical pain and, and injury when I was under the influence of drugs. And it made things a lot easier. It made things like a, like a movie. It took away the reality. It took away the emotion. And it made the Satan of service too easy. Mm. Well, you served him well. You killed two people. You went to prison. You were bitter, unfeeling. In fact, can you tell the incident about um, what happened to you even in prison? I'd like to answer about prison right. with scripture. All right. 
If you recall the spirit of confusion that the Amalekites subjected the children of Israel to yes. when they left Egypt, it took them 40 years to make a, what, an 11 or 12 day journey. When you go to prison, you can have a one to two year sentence, and that's the spirit of confusion that you're confronted with. If you recall the, the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, all this sin, all the iniquity, that's what prison is like. If you recall the depravity and idolatry of Syria, of Babylonia, that's what prison is like. And the frame of mind that I was in, I fit right in. So it is hell. It is hell. It is. And when you got there, you didn't get any better. I mean, you were still unruly, and you told me, how many years did you spend in, what do you call it, the hole? Solitary confinement, which is what we call the hole, um, a room that's about six feet by eight feet. I spent for about three to three and a half years in solitary. Why? There was an old Indian guy that lived there that I knew real well, and he called me the unruly one. And I was. I, I had no regard for other people's feelings. I had no regard for any of the policies or procedures of the institution. I didn't care. I got to the point where, in 1973, I quit using drugs because it wasn't enough. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't make me feel what I wanted to feel. But violence could make me feel that way. It could make me get away from the things that bothered me. To just be mean. To just be mean. So you had to be demon-possessed. I believe so. One of the guys that I associated with most the eight years that I was there was a satanic priest. And I can see very clearly now what kind of influences he had on me. That's incredible. Pete, now you're working with young people trying to get them off drugs, get them off alcohol, keep them out of prison. What happened to change your life? Well, it was, it was a very interesting experience. It's the kind of experience that you wouldn't take a million dollars for. And at the same time, it wasn't easy. I don't think I'd want to go through all that again for two million. But the Lord knew me, as he knows everybody. And he knew that I'm hard-headed. And he knew he was going to have to show me. And so he started putting evidence in my life. Uh, I met a really outstanding woman through correspondence. And it wasn't enough. It didn't get my attention. And so he allowed me to get shot. Now, there was a lot of incidents of violence in the prison where I was, wasn't when I was injured. Um, this came closer to killing me than anything. You were actually shot in prison? Yes. By another prisoner? Yes. And there was a lot of animosity about it uh, among my friends in the prison. By the time I got out of the hospital, I wasn't interested in, in all the games or the, the petty warfare that, that goes on down there. There's, there's nothing for, in my heart for those people but love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really tough for some of them to believe that. Mm -hmm. But I always pray for them, and I pray that the Spirit will move on them so that they can believe me, so they know what it's like. How do you feel about the one that shot you? I heard that he was recently saved, and it, it just brought a lot of joy to my heart. I've been praying for him for a long time. Okay. When did you actually give your heart to Jesus? I recommitted my life to the Lord in the uh, spring of 1979. How did it happen? Well, when I was shot, God spoke to me audibly. But it never occurred to me what was going on. I thought at first that I was, you know, that I just lost my mind. <laughs> I, had, I had no idea that that could happen to me, you know, to Moses maybe, not to me. <laughs> uh, later, the woman who is now my wife brought me a Bible in the hospital. And I knew that she's a lot like me and that she's real stubborn. I knew that I was going to have to read what she told me to read or she would never leave me alone. Good. <laughs> so she, uh, she told me to read 1 Corinthians 13. 
and it really turned me around. It, it really spoke to my heart a lot. That is beautiful. You know, that is one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Word of God, and to know that that saved your life. Then how did you get out of prison for two murders? How many years were you sentenced to? Well, I had uh, two sentences, one of 10 to life and one of 10 to 20. And the way they were compiled by the Attorney General, I was doing life with no parole. But the Lord saw fit to put another Attorney General in whose interpretation of the law allowed me a parole date. And as I grew in the Lord, he just kept manifesting more and more miracles in our lives. Uh, I used to be an epileptic, and he healed me of that. He showed me that it's a spiritual battle. And I stood on the scripture, and I quit taking my medication, and I haven't had a seizure since 1979. So, Pete, I see love, I see joy, I see peace. You take no drugs? No. You take no alcohol? No. have no more violence in your life? Oh, I get ornery sometimes. Well, we all do. I, I mean, know, a little. I've seen you be <laughs> Just a little. <Yeah. laughs> but this forgiveness for the one that shot you is what just absolutely was so incredible. And that you and your wife were praying for him. We still do. Can you just tell him he might be watching? Just tell him you love him? We do love you. And we do keep you in our prayers. And there's a lot of people down there that I had trouble with. And it's not just one man, it's not just one group. I pray for everybody that's down there because I know what it's like when I did eight years when every day was the same day. There's no changes. It's all exactly the same. You wake up in the morning and the sun's just barely coming up and you feel like you've been up for a year. So I know what it's like, and I don't think anybody ought to live like that. And Jesus can bring them out. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, our time is up, but I just want to thank Pete. I want to thank his wife, Jennifer. Thank you, darling, for holding on. Another one snatched from the grasp of Satan into the arms of Jesus. And that forgiveness that you have for the one that shot you, I just praise God for that. And I pray that the ones that you injured, that they forgive you. If we could all forgive each other in the world, Pete, like you have, and like the ones must do you, then there wouldn't be any more problems. There wouldn't be any more troubles. People holding bitterness will destroy you. It'll eat you up and destroy you. This man was shot by a brother that now he loves and prays for. That is love. That is 1 Corinthians 13, Amen. love. And if you don't know what that scripture says, you read it for yourself. It's my favorite scripture. Every time I sign my name, I put that scripture, 1 Corinthians 13. It is truly Jesus' love. And Pete, let me tell you, I love you. Keep up the good work, okay? I will. Thank you. And we love all of the men that are in prison. We are going to see that there are satellite dishes in every prison in America. That will allow us to get them in. So that people like Lee, people like Roman Stone, people like John, a lot of people can find Jesus as their Savior. Pete, will you pray with us for that? All right, let's do right now. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this life changed. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us get satellite dishes into every prison yes, so Lord. that those that are locked behind bars can be free in Jesus. Hallelujah. And we Hallelujah. thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, and we love you. God bless you. I love you, Pete. Love you <laughs> it's great. Oh. And her soul was 
Spirit River is flowing right now all across America into the prison cells as we're listening to the testimonies as we're understanding the love of Jesus Christ I feel a blessed Holy Ghost anointing flowing across this miracle of television and you know right now you can invite the presence of the Lord into your life you can say yes to Jesus no matter where you are in the living room or in the motel room in the loneliness of your life are there in the prison cell locked in in a physical walls crushing in are the spiritual walls of life may have you pressed down but Jesus says if you drink of this water you will never thirst again he says I want to give unto you life and more abundant life something that you can take a hold of right now stepping out into the rivers of God feasting on the blessings of God the abundant river of God is flowing for you 
It's for all of us here in the studio audience as well. I was singing it. I noticed people would just kind of say yes to Jesus and let that river flow. And I believe the same thing needs to happen in your life right now. As we were singing, there is a river that flows from deep within. You may not have understood what was happening, but you felt the presence of God right there in your room. You can just say yes to Jesus. There's a number on your screen. You can call a counselor. If you don't know how to pray, you can just say, I need help. I want somebody to pray with. And somebody will on the other end of that phone say, Jesus loves you. They will pray with you. You will understand for the first time in your life, perhaps, that there is a true meaning to the word love as the river of God flows into your life. Hallelujah. Right now, I believe we can do this. I see counselors are praying, but right now, I want you to just pray with me and invite Jesus into your life. Heavenly Father, I love you today for this opportunity, and I thank you for sending Jesus into this world to set me free from the sin of, that I have committed. I confess that sin. You said if I would confess it, that you would forgive me of it, and I confess my sins. And I ask Jesus into my life right now. Are you repeating this prayer with me? Ask Jesus into my heart right now. I want from this moment forward, I want to be a new person in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away, the Bible says, and all things are become new. Jesus, it's a new beginning with you right now. I accept Jesus as Lord in my life. Did you pray with me? Call that number on your screen and, and just share with one of these beautiful counselors. I was in there before the program began. A Holy Ghost anointing was just, they were just praying before the counselors, actually we, before we went on the air. And they believe that as we begin to pray and as we begin to sing, as we begin to worship the Lord, that you were going to call in. And so they're ready for you to call. They want Jesus to move in your life today. I want that river of abundance. It's a love that flows. The Bible says it flows from the throne room of God. I believe you can feel it today. Paul and Jan, I feel David. the river of God flowing all across wherever you're watching. <laughs> Jesus is real. He is Lord over all. I praise him for that river today. Hallelujah. David, they are calling already. They're calling. A hundred have called and more. And we're going to lay them out before the Lord. And if you didn't get through, please keep dialing across America. Call the number nearest you on your screen. And confess with your mouth now, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. You need to do that. Do it now. Don't put it off another minute. There's someone that will talk with you and love you and pray you into the kingdom. Amen. If you'll just call right now. Dial if you have to dial a hundred times yeah. to get through on that line. Your soul is worth it. Do it in Jesus' name. Here to help us keep on praising the Lord and preach some more of the Word and give the devil some more trouble tonight is a brother that we love with all our heart. He is our family. He is our brother. You know, I don't think I could love anybody any more than I love that brother. I mean that. I just don't know of anybody I love more than I love you, Dr. Hill. Let me give him a proper... Let me give him a proper... Thank you very much. I'm glad you cleared that up. I do. <laughs> Let me give him a proper introduction. Most of you know him and love him as Jan and I do. But in case you haven't met Dr. Edward V. Hill, E. V. Hill, he is the pastor of a great church here in South Central Los Angeles. I love the name. Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Boy, that has a good ring to it, doesn't it? And he's been pastoring this church for over 20 years. Dr. Hill has been voted as one of the top ten ministers or preachers in America by Time in Magazine. In the world. Yes, yes. When Dr. Hill is not preaching in his own church, he's out traveling across the country, holding revival meetings, preaching on praise the Lord, bringing thousands of people to the Lord. Render honor to whom honor is due. Let's tell him we love him, Dr. E.V. Hill. From Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, Los Angeles. How's my brain? Give me another hug. I'm glad. Glad to be here. We're glad to, to have you. Glad Such to see joy you. joy to have you. Bye. What's the Lord been doing? Let's sit down well, for a course, minute if we can. Yes. We'll, we'll be standing up again yes. for long, I have a feeling. But Well, of course, the, one of the great things that has happened is I've been traveling around, <clears throat> and I was all down in Florida. Really? And... Um, it was amazing to me how many people would come up and say, I saw you on uh, 
Channel Paul, 45. No, Paul and Jan, you know, <laughs> everywhere, Paul and Jan. And then as I moved on up, uh, you know, we're getting into Dallas. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know that we were really covering Dallas. Dallas and Fort Worth. But Dallas and Fort Worth is saturated and then in the Washington area. Yeah. So as I've been traveling around, God has been um, revealing that the word is going forth, the people are listening, and the people are excited. As you travel, what, what do you sense in your spirit, Dr. Hill? What's the spirit of the Lord doing? Well, uh, there's a double sensation. First of all, God is really moving. Praise God. God is really moving. He is bringing people together as never before. There is a great outpouring of compassion for the poor. Uh, you know, we met uh, uh, two weeks ago in uh, Dallas, Texas, and we had the pastors, uh, 150 pastors of some of the largest churches in the world uh, in Dallas for this uh, two-day workshop on what local churches can do for the poor. Mm -hmm. And there is this outpouring, this compassion for the poor. And uh, they are believing uh, that, first of all, that God, the fast that God would have us have is the fast which uh, puts clothes on the naked and yes, uh, feeds the hungry and brings those who are outdoors indoors. And then we're believing the promises. God says then your light will break and your uh, darkness will become as noonday. And all of that is right in the scripture. And um, uh, they're finding this, they're believing this, and they're ready for action. So across the nation, there is great revival, there's great resurgence. In my own denomination, we had a great time in Miami. We had 25,000. We had a change in leadership. Uh, we have a new president now, a new vice president. What denomination is uh, that? Baptist. I'm a missionary Baptist. Missionary Baptist. And um, so we had a change in uh, um, leadership. Our past administration was great leader, no question about it. But there is a fullness of time in everything, okay. and uh, the delegates felt that it was the time and the moment where we would get new leadership. So things are just pushing forward. God right. is just God. encouraging the saints. Yeah. Saints are believing, yeah. uh, and they are encouraged in their belief more than ever before. Churches are breaking out everywhere. Really? New churches, the ones that are not preaching are drying up. The new ones are building up. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, that separation time is here, isn't it? God yeah. separating, isn't he? Yeah. The sheep yeah. from the goats, yeah. the wheat from the tares. Yes, and then I think that uh, he's proving himself to those who will trust him. Uh, God has always had his hands reached out towards us, but we have had our hands in other directions. Mm -hmm. And uh, God has a way of drying up our, our uh, wells and then still compassionately pleading, saying, look unto me and be saved. Making us dig uh, a new one every yes, once in a while. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of excitement all over the country. People are uh, getting involved. Uh, we are seeing witnessing as never before. The World Christian Training Center is just breaking out. We are now in nine cities. We have uh, headquarters in nine cities with great big sign, Jesus' campaign headquarters. <laughs> really? And, really? Uh, the devil's in trouble, isn't it? Yeah, it's real exciting. In <laughs> Dallas, we have this building and we have this sign right on Martin Luther King Boulevard. It says, Jesus' campaign headquarters. <laughs> I love it. And so this fella just stumbled in. It's in South Dallas. Uh, and uh, it's in what is called a, a depressed area and a lot of crime. Uh, this young white girl was working in the office there after 6 o'clock. This guy just burst right in, and he was high and what have you. And she was very fearful for her own life. But he walked in, and he said, well, I done tried everything else, so whoever headquarters this is, I want to try him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's an old song called Try Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he prayed to receive Christ. Oh, he came man. back the next day after he had sobered up <laughs> and got some more understanding as to what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just amazing what's, what's going on. One of the largest congregations in Dallas held a three-day conference where over 800 of their members came out every night, uh, the Highland Presbyterian Church, to commit themselves to helping the poor. Mm. And so things are just really moving. You know what? I saw you 
in a newscast a few days ago, uh, President Reagan was speaking. Yes. And you were, and you were right about mind. the third seat down. Yes. What, what was that all about? That was the National Negro Council of Republicans. Oh, See, when I left yes. Miami, I flew to Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had our National uh, Council of Negro Republicans convention. Mm -hmm. And uh, President Reagan was our guest. I gave the invocation that night, and uh, he was our guest for our national council. We had uh, some 1,600 people out there that night, and very few people know that that, that many Negro Republicans. And so it was good. They all paid $150 a plate, so oh, really? they made a great sacrifice to be there. Rich. What are some of the things the president said to you? Well, I think he said three things that I was personally interested in. I prayed for four, and I got three, so you can't, uh, you can't argue average. with that. Uh, number one, his whole thrust in the minority community will be in minority businesses. Mm -hmm. Small businesses, small business loans, helping the small business. Well, that's where we are as minorities. Mm -hmm. We're not the uh, giant corporations. We're small businesses. Some still mom and pop store. One of my members came to me last night. Uh, he and his family have figured out some games whereby kids can learn how to multiply and to figure. And uh, this will be an opportunity for him to get funded. So he's going to put a lot of emphasis on small businesses. But I think even more important, he promised that night that the federal government itself would uh, buy uh, a lot of the goods that are produced by minority people. Mm -hmm. um, you would be amazed at how much ground beef is bought by the federal government and yes. there are contracts everywhere. But third, and most of all, uh, he promised and has started completing his promise that he would save Negro colleges throughout the United States. Uh, we have more than 20 Negro colleges that are facing foreclosure, uh, I mean going out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has pledged that he, wherever possible, he would save. Those are old institutions that gave us our preachers, our lawyers, our doctors, mm -hmm. long before the large white institutions opened up for Negro people. Mm -hmm. We want those institutions saved. We, yes. we, we appreciate the fact that we're now going to Harvard and Yale, but we haven't forgotten Bishop and Gramlin and all of our mm -hmm. other schools that gave us our foundation and in which our roots are still planted. Mm -hmm. So those were three of the four things I was hoping he would say, and he said them. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a good report, too. I know you're also a member of this uh, private sector initiative that President Reagan is urging us all to get involved in. And I just, I know your church is, is doing such a great work there in South Central Los Angeles. And I just want to give you a little report that Trinity Broadcasting has gotten involved. And I get a report every week. And we're having between three and 500 people a day coming through. Uh, right across the street to a little ministry we call His Hand Extended and getting food and clothing and Amen. all kinds of things. And I think that's one reason God's blessing Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church and why God's blessing TBN and anyone that will reach out and touch. Well, in 1935, 50% of all of the relief that poor people received was from religious organizations. Mm -hmm. What percentage? In 1935, 50%. In 1980, only 1%. Mm. Mm. So we fell from 50% to 1% between 1935 and 1980. Mm. And so what has to happen, you see, you see, what really happened was we entered a period where we, we forgot our commission and the mandates of the scriptures to the poor. And we became satisfied with the government doing it. And the only time we became dissatisfied is when they got too big a pull out of our pocketbook. Mm -hmm. See, well, they, we didn't know they were going to get that much out of our pocketbook, but when they really went for the kill, <laughs> uh, then we grumbled. But the grumbling is only because we created the situation. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. uh, the poor should be able to come to those of us who have Amen. and receive help. Amen. And God has locked up joy and blessing that will not be unlocked until we unlock our coffers and let the poor be Amen. blessed. Amen. Amen. He won't do it. You yeah. know, I'll guarantee you, you could trace with those same statistics how the church went down yes. during that time. Paul says mm -hmm. now, he says, 
if every church that's hurting out there would announce on Sunday, all the poor come, there's going to be clothing, there's going to be food, you can eat, why those churches would be packed and jammed with Amen. people. And let, then they could preach the gospel to them. Let me say something that happened to me just a few days ago. Pastor, I was in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. just a few days ago attending the National uh, Congressional Advisory Council meeting. And I took a little walk out of my hotel, and I walked by. I didn't even realize that Dr. Peter Marshall's church was just a few blocks down from my hotel, the great New York... Um, uh, not congregational, but I'll think of it in just a moment. But anyhow, for years, Dr. Peter Marshall pastored that church uh, just a few blocks from my hotel. In fact, uh, a subsequent pastor of that church preached a mighty sermon. I, re I stood there and read the little memorial plaque on the church. And from that sermon came forth the words, Under God, that got added into our Pledge of Allegiance mm -hmm. to the flag. One nation under God. But, Pastor, what broke my heart is I stood there and I read that plaque and I could see off a couple of blocks away the blinking lights of the sin factories. Mm -hmm. I could hear the blare of the music. I could see the adult movie theaters within sight of the front door of that great church. And I looked up at this great church and it was closed, locked, tight, Bars over the windows, the protective, you know, mesh that they pull and lock to keep people from breaking in. And I thought, oh, how true the words of Jesus. He said, the children of darkness are in their way wiser than even the children of light. Amen. Because the devil keeps his businesses open 24 hours a day. You yes. can walk into a dirty sin factory at 3 o'clock in the morning, but the churches are locked tight and closed. And I don't know, Dr. Hill, something came over me, and I just said, Oh, God, oh, God, thank God, first of all, for 24-hour-a-day Christian television yeah, that's on the air so that you can amen. tune in around the con. But I, you know, churches that want to grow and want to, you know, see the pews filled and see people coming to the altars, boy, if, if, if they'd only try it one day a week and keep that church open 24 hours a day and keep the doors yeah. wide open. Saturday night, by the way, would be a good night. Yeah. You know, when people are out and they're wondering and they're lost and they're lonely and they're hopeless and they don't know where to go. And so, man, hey, the devil's gang is over there and there's a guy out on the street saying, come on in, have a... F have a yeah. Hey, free. free. No, no, free look. Come on in for a free look, you know. Wouldn't you like to come on? Hey... And if only the church would be that wise and say, come on in. There's, come on. There's, there's warm food in here. There's a bed. There's clothing. There's love. There's real love. Oh, pastor, how can we get our churches well, motivated? To first of all, we have to recognize the problem, what happens. Uh, all of our churches at one time or another was at the level of the poor. But you see, when God saves you, he improves you, he blesses you, and he takes the risk of you forgetting where he found you. Mm. Do you see? Mm. See, yeah. he takes the risk. He, he, see, I was found by God in a log cabin with nothing to eat and with nothing but poor people. Now, since that time, I have slept in a mini mansion <laughs> and uh, I've flown on a mini comfortable plane. And I have to be the one who wrestles with me to make sure that I don't forget those who have not reached where I am. Now, the average church is not prepared to reach the people we're talking about. That's why the parachurch movements have come into being. That's why the missions. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now, right now, feeding 3,000 uh, men a night on the streets of Los Angeles. Praise God! Uh, no, no, no. I mean, through missions. Yeah. Through missions. Oh, hold it. We are helping, but it's through missions. All right. But the only reason why these missions have had to do it is because our churches are not. So then we have these parachurch movements. So what has happened is, as you trust God, God's going to inevitably bless you with things. But whenever he blesses you with things, he, he never has you in mind. He has others in mind. His kingdom. That's right. You see, you see when the Lord blesses you, when the Lord gives you a blessing, he, he really doesn't have you in mind. Yeah, he has the poor. He's hunting for a channel. We make ourselves reservoirs. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> Busy. And the church has made itself a reservoir. Uh, I've often said to our church, we will never have any money. We will never have any money in the bank. We'll never have any money on savings. We will never have any of that because we will constantly give it away. Yes. God. Yes. Right. Constantly give it away. That's the secret, isn't it? Is it? Because we want to be a channel. Amen. We want to be a river that's flowing <laughs> and not a reservoir. But now keep in mind, if the Lord ever decides that he can get through you, he will send it to you. <laughs> there you Oh, write that down, folks. If he ever, write that down. If it, if, if he Say ever it again. If God ever discovers that he can get through you, he'll send it to you. Okay. And there is no way to imagine how much God will send to you when he's confident that it'll get on through you. You see, Glory. because, because you, you said, take for instance when he said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. The very next sentence is, and all nations shall come and be blessed out of thee. I'm not going to bless you just to be Abraham. I'm going to bless you because out of thee, all nations and many nations will be blessed. Yes, yes. And so we have to learn that we are only channels of blessings mm. we, through which God flows to others. Now, the tragedy of our time since 1935, our churches, and including mine, were blessed, first of all, saved by God, then blessed by God, then lifted by God, and we forgot to lift. Mm -hmm. And so the church moved away from the poor to the extent that the average church is not equipped for, to save this world. Mm -hmm. What church is really equipped for a bunch of winos to come in right now? And, and, and be saved. I pray for them the, in our the, chapel out yes. here. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying the, the typical yeah, church. Yeah. Suppose right now at, at the typical suburban or uh, middle class uh, uh, ethnic church, uh, a, a group of prostitutes would come in and say, what must I do to be saved? It mean, would disrupt the meeting. They wouldn't know what to how to handle it. They wouldn't know how to handle it. No. So we have to, and that's why we have to get the, well, I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine. <laughs> I had a friend of mine in Atlanta, Georgia, I don't mind mentioning the town, I won't mention the church, <laughs> who put on a 11 weeks revival and saw 20 some hundred people saved. Mm. But the board met and said, now, but what, what do you plan to do with them? Oh. And he said, well, we plan to bring them in church. Not this church. Oh, pastor. He said, these, these people are widows, long hair, Dope addicts, oh, uh, prostitutes. He said, Reverend, you got to get them kind of cleaned up before they can come in here. Oh. I'll give you another one. Oh. i give you another Jesus. one. Jesus, help we helped a church out in Compton uh, have vacation Bible school. They had never had vacation Bible school uh, before, and we helped them. We enrolled 125, and we left them 47 candidates for baptism. Mm. Now, the next year I called and said, are you getting ready for vacation Bible school? He said, well, no. We're not going to have it this year, Hill. I said, well, why? He said, well, see, we painted our church, and we got new pews, and we got rugs, oh. and those kids will come in and just tear up this church. Oh. So we have a bigger problem than what we think we have. Mm -hmm. church we have to work the on the church as well as the sinners. You know what Jesus says about mm -hmm. those kinds of churches? Yeah, they make him sick. That's I will right. spew and me too. thee out of my mouth. <laughs> and me too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Pastor, I remember, I remember, and then, then I'm through. I remember. Well, we want you to get into that word in a minute I remember here, I passed the church once, and a young lady came in ill-clad, and they eyed her all the way up front, I know. and she got embarrassed, and they eyed her all the way out. And so we have, we have great problems. Uh, but uh, getting back to your simple question of what's happening, God's breaking through. In spite of its all. In spite of its all. Glory to God. Just before David Sapp sings one more song, and then whenever I get Pastor Hill here, I love for him to just get into the book. Oh, how I, how I love. I'll, I don't know. There's something about one sermon I heard you preach, Pastor Hill, when you were speaking from uh, Thomas Road Baptist Jerry Church, oh, Jerry yeah. Falwell's church, on the prodigal son. Oh. You'll never know how that sermon blessed and touched Jane Turn and me. Turn back. Yeah. Turn back. 
turn no matter where you are on that road, yeah. you can turn okay. around. Yeah. You can at any point. Back. At any point, oh, you can. You don't have to. Point. You don't have to reach the hog pen. No. no. You can turn around at oh. any point. Oh my. Let me read a couple scriptures right along this line. In Revelation, yet there is one thing wrong. You don't love me as at first. Amen. Think about those times of your first love. Mm. And how different now. And turn back to me again and work as you did before, or else I will come and remove your candlestick from its place among your churches. This message is from the one who stands firm, the faithful and true witness. Mm. I know you well. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you're mu merely mu uh, lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich with everything you want. I won't. I don't need a thing. And you, yet you don't realize that you are spiritually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Mm. That is God's word. Woo. To any church that doesn't help the poor and isn't on fire. They're and worse isn't in than the person they won't help. Yes, yes, yeah. in the sight of God. They are. Mm. Yeah. Well, perhaps the Holy Spirit will use these simple words we've shared to build a fire under some of our churches and mm. pastors and deacons and elders and just... Mm. Well, i tell you what I did a, a couple of, a two or three years ago. I just raised the question in my own mind, how easy is it for the poor to get into Mount Zion? Hmm. You know, I, I began to look at my own situation where, you know, we've moved from buses to uh, Lincolns, we've moved from walking <laughs> to Mercedes Benz, <laughs> and I began to wonder whether or not Mount Zion is a church where the poor. Second of all, I began to wonder whether or not Mount Zion had lost its compassion for the poor. And that's how we got into the Hungry People Drive last year. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, we're right in the midst of it this year. Oh, we, we reached, uh, we are, as you know, in the heart of a poor community, and we have relatively poor members of our church. But we raised 63000 last year. For the poor. Uh, bless the Just poor. for the poor. We were there, we know. Dan and I were there. And uh, this year, I think we're going to come pretty close to it again. And the people are all excited, and they're giving, and they're giving to the poor. And uh, so I would say to any pastor that you ought to uh, concern yourself about your church's ministry to the poor. And don't get caught up in colonizing, but stick to evangelizing. Right. Uh, most people are, most churches are trying to win their kind. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see? And that's colonizing. That's not evangelizing. <laughs> do you see? Uh, well said. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Just before David sings, it seems like we are working on a little project, are we not? Yes. I believe yes. Jerry Falwell yes. is coming to your yes. church. Yes. And we're going to and try and Jan and Paul yes. Crouch. We're going to be. All will be there the same night. And what we're, night is? We're going to roll. 29th of November. That's it. And we're 29th going to of November. You'll roll be the rolling Holy right from Mount Zion Baptist Church. <laughs> broadcasting right. nationwide. November 29th. It'll be on the air, coast to coast. And uh, it'll be a joy just to be on the front row. Amen and everything you wow, and Jerry Wow, what a say. package. Oh, right. Mount Zion Baptist Church, the choir. Paul and Jan, the choir, oh. and Jerry Falwell preaching. Woo! Dear Lord, well, we'll put everybody, you better get ready to build a new balcony or something. We'll, well have, we'll to. have te television sets everywhere. All right. All right. We'll, okay. we'll have a great night. I'm surely looking forward. You we'll guys sing my song. If it had if not it been. If it had not been. <laughs> for the Lord. Lord. Oh, my oh, my God. Jan. I tell you, Paul has to pinch me to make sure I hadn't died and gone to heaven when I go to your church. No, what I really have to do is I have to hold, hold her, her down when I get her in Mount Zion Church because she's ready to go. It is just oh. great. So we'll be looking, we'll be announcing that many more times before the 29th of November, 1982. November. David, sad. God bless you, brother. We love that precious anointing we see on you. Just mm -hmm. sing from your heart. And now what more appropriate song than what we've just been talking about than this song, The Language of Love. Let's tell David Sapp one more time we're loving as he sings. <laughs>
Cause it's one thing we all need But the greatest love of all Was when he came to die for me We can talk about a love That we don't think will be true Or hold our hand But when we're true to Jesus And hold his hand He helps us understand The language of love The language of love It's what I can understand The language of love I know it's for real, man. When he came into this world to die for us, gave his life on cruel Calvary, that's the language of love. The language of love. If I could recall the words of one. Long ago, who said how he loved somebody, but that somebody was dead. For he gave his life that all of us might live. Now that's what I call talking in the language of love. The language of love It's what I can understand The language of love I know it's for real When he came into this world to die for us Gave his life on cruel Calvary That's the language the language of love When he came into this world To die for you and me Gave his life on cruel Calvary Now that's what I call Talking in the language of love Listen to Jesus today He's talking to you in a language that we all can understand. That's the language of love. I love you, Jesus. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer as God gets ready now to speak to us. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for these moments that we have here and throughout the land, wherever you have permitted us to go with this television. And we pray now that it would please you to please let us preach. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read a passage of scripture to you that's found in the 16th chapter of the gospel according to Matthews. Matthews, the 16th chapter. And if you'll turn... Uh, to the 13th verse. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some said John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Think with me, please, as I uh, speak to you from the subject Jesus in proper focus. Jesus in proper focus. If your television set is all right, you are receiving 
an image of myself and the background, clear cut color uh, presentation and proper presentation of my image, all 295 pounds. <laughs> but if for some reason something would go wrong with one of these cameras, uh, if one of these cameramen would not know what to do, it would be possible to get a distorted picture of me. And we call that adjusting the camera and getting it into proper focus. My wife often uh, takes a lot of pictures and it's always amazing to me how many times the heads are cut off. Uh, the, sometimes she gets just halfway between and, <laughs> and sometimes it's, it, it's, it's all because the focusing was not proper. And as I have gone across the length and breadth of this country, there is one thing that has happened all over America that is the work of Satan, and that is most people have n not gotten the proper focus of Jesus Christ. Jesus is out of focus. Thus, he does not look like the biblical Christ, and for a lot of Christians, he does not act like the biblical Christ, because Jesus is not in proper focus. There are many distorted images of Jesus Christ. There, and as you walk, and, and, and sometimes while you are in a big city, catch a bus, walk down the street, and just ask different people, who is Jesus Christ? Just take a simple survey like Campus Crusade up and down the streets and, 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 and ask people, who is Jesus Christ? And you will find that in spite of all of the information, in spite of uh, uh, Trinity Broadcasting, in spite of Campus Crusade, in spite of Billy Graham, because of the activity of Satan, the devil has distorted the picture, the image of Jesus Christ to the point that there are very few people who can give you a clear-cut statement as to who is Jesus Christ. Now, there are those who try to compliment Jesus Christ. There are those who su suggest that Jesus Christ was a great religious leader. That's not in proper focus. He is more than a great religious leader. As a matter of fact, he never organized a religion and he never declared himself as a leader. And so to put Jesus in the category with other leaders, and there are a lot of people who say, that's who he is. He is a leader like other great religious leaders. And I bought a book once <laughs> entitled The Great Leaders of Religion. And in there they had Buddha and they had Muhammad and they had Moses. And then in the middle of all, they had Jesus Christ. That's out of focus. You don't have, you've got, to, you've got to, as I tell my wife, you've got to tinker with that thing and get it in focus. Because if Jesus to you is only a one of the great religious leaders of our time, you don't have him properly focused. He's not along with nobody. He's not along, he's not a leader along with Elijah Muhammad. He's not a leader along with Moses and all the rest of them and Abraham. Abraham would have rejoiced to have seen Jesus. And so if he's only a religious leader, if he's only a religious leader, you don't have the proper understanding about Jesus Christ. And then some are not even willing to say that he was a religious leader. Some say he was just a leader. He was just a leader where a whole lot of people followed him and a whole lot of people in the United States, kooks and people out of their minds and lonely and old women and little children follow him around now. But if that's your concept of Jesus, you don't have him in focus. You don't have him in focus. He's more than a leader. He's, he's beyond just being a leader. 
He is beyond being just a religious leader, just a great teacher, as some people say. Well, he was just a great teacher. He was a teacher just like other teachers, just like Confucius, just like uh, uh, other leaders in India and what have you. That's who Jesus is. No, no. You don't have him in focus. You don't have him in focus. And because you don't have him in focus, you have not prayed the right prayer. Because if you don't have the correct understanding and the correct vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't understand who he is, why he came, what he did, and what he's doing, you're not saved. And so I've come to share with you tonight the proper focus of Jesus Christ. I, I want you to know when you have him, how he'll look. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus said to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who am I according to men? I have, Jesus had been with them. He had called them. He had performed miracles. He had done this and had done that. He had just healed multitudes. He had just fed thousands in the previous uh, chapter in the book of Matthew. And now Jesus asked those who had been with him, who do men say that I am? Who am I according to men? Who am I? And then it was, it, it, it was uh, immediately they said, some said, you are John the Baptist. And some said, you are Elijah in verse 14. And some said, you are Jeremiah the prophet. Now note all of these were good and great and noble and godly men. But Jesus is more than a good, great, godly man. Jesus is more than a contender for righteousness and moral ethics and religious creeds. He's more than that. And so Jesus said, but I, I want to make this, Peter, I want to set a precedent here because this is how people are going to be saved from now on. But whom do you say I am? You see, it wasn't by accident that Jesus made it personal because that's how you are saved. You're not saved by who your church feels Jesus is. And you're not saved by who your bishop or pastor believes Jesus is. You are ultimately saved by answering the question, who do you say Amen. Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? You believe, if you don't believe that Jesus is more than John the Baptist, you're not saved. But John the Baptist was simply a forerunner, simply one who went before him. If you don't believe that he's more than the prophet. Elijah was a great prophet. The fire did fall, but Jesus was there sending down the fire. If you don't believe that he's more than Jeremiah, you're not saved. There has to be a certain belief about Jesus before you're saved. You've got to have a saving knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ. And he's not in focus. He's not in focus if he's just a teacher. He's not in focus if he's just a leader among other leaders. And it is very popular among you who are Baha'is and what have you. You claim that Jesus is is just among the other gods. Ain't but one. Ain't not but one. All others are false. Amen. And that which is false is not. The money that I thought I had, but I don't have, I don't have. And thus it's not money. And Jesus is not one, and I want to repeat that over again. He has no peer. He has no equal. There is nobody in the same class with him. Nobody on the track with him. He's Lord God all by himself. And so if Jesus to you is still a man, you haven't gotten him high enough. You got to fool with that camera and, and focus in on him. He's higher than man. Amen. And so Peter comes back here with saving testimony. He comes with the testimony that can save you. 
And in this next verse, Simon Peter answered and said, I know who you are. And look what he says. Thou art the Christ, Amen. the Son of the living God. Ah, oh, that's him in focus. That's him. That's him. Now listen, my beloved. At the Garden of Eden and at the gates of Eden, we were promised a Christ. We were promised an atoner. We were promised a redeemer. We were promised someone who would set right again the broken relationship of God and man. Now that's what we were promised. Now, all down through the ages, we have heard from prophets, we heard from the patriarchs, and we found it in the script that an atoner, a Messiah was to come and is to come. All of the prophets said, he is to come. Now, all down through the ages, there have been those who have popped up saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Christ, I'm the one. This is the one who should come. Look at me, I can save, I can save. And many people have been confused, and maybe you're one. Since everybody's saying, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, maybe you're confused. But my dears, I want to tell you that God has fixed it so there can be no confusion Amen. about who is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because God not only made the promise, but he gave us 4,000 years of prophecy which describes the Christ, which crosses every T and dots every I. Now, let, let me give you an example. If I would tell Paul, if I would just say, Paul, I have a friend that's coming in uh, at uh, Los Angeles International Airport. Would you go out there and pick him up? Now, if that's all that I would say to Paul, I would just say, go pick up my friend at the International Airport. Now, there are uh, 13 different uh, uh, satellite areas, and there are, I don't know how many planes, hundreds of them coming in uh, every day, and 30 or 40 different airlines coming in, and all I would say to Paul, just go out and pick up my friend. I wouldn't tell him when he's coming in. I wouldn't tell him what airline. I wouldn't tell him what day. I would just say, go out and pick up my friend. Now, the possibility of Paul going out picking up my friend well, first of all, if he would leave home going out there, I'd feel a little funny about it. With just that, that much information, I wouldn't even leave home. Because how can you go out to an airport where 30 million people come in every year just walking around talking about, are you Brother Hill's friend? Are you Brother Hill's friend? Are you Brother Hill's friend? And then some people would go out there and try to find somebody and make him my friend just because he kind of looks funny. <laughs> and somebody would come out there and look funny or uh, do some holy move. He said, oh, that's, that, that's Brother Hill's friend. That's Brother Hill's friend. And then some people would go out there and try to guess that that's Brother Hill's friend. And that's how some of you are trying to find Jesus. Yeah, right. Just who comes to town and put up a tent, whoo, that must be him over there, that must be him over there, that must be him over there, no, he's over here, no, he's over there, no, he's over there, and many of you are at home frustrated because you have run to and fro. But God did more for us than that. Oh, praise his holy name. God wrote down at least 323 prophecies describing the Christ. Now, let me give you another illustration. Suppose I said to Paul, Paul, I want you to pick up my friend. And you'll know him. He weighs 350 pounds. He is a shade darker than I am. He will be wearing green boots. He will have on a red tie. He will have a gold tooth on his right side. He will be bald-headed. He will wear black glasses. 
I think you could find him. And if I tell you that he's coming in on United Airlines, Flight 90 at 110, I think you could find him. Anybody getting off plane looking like that and you got the exact number, you could find him. Well, that's what God did. That's what God did. God said, you don't have to be guessing whether somebody who came in from the east is the Christ. You don't have to be guessing whether somebody who's an agora from India came in, he's the Christ. You don't have to be worried about whether somebody born in Georgia is the Christ. I got the yardstick. Oh, yes, I have the yardstick. And listen what the yardstick says. First of all, he's got to be born in Bethlehem. Amen. Amen. If he's not born in Bethlehem, if he was not born in a stable, laid in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, he is not the Christ. He said he's got to be born of a virgin. If he's not born of a virgin, if he's not virgin born, he's not the Christ. His exact date of birth was prophesied. And if he was just born, he's too young. (laughs) Nobody 60 and 70 years old is the Christ. Our Christ on this earth is almost 2,000 years old according to prophecy. And if it doesn't fulfill that, he's not the Christ. Don't give your life behind somebody just born in 1950. Who was the one who was born 1,800 years ago or 1,900 years ago? That's the Christ, son of the living God. Our Bible says that he must be born of a virgin. Our Bible says he must speak in parables. Our Bible says that he must be sinless. None of these who've been in prison four times and who have committed all kinds of sin, they can be saved, but they're not our Christ. Our Christ sinned not. He sinned not. Sinless, spotless Lamb of God given by God. John was right when John said, Behold, God's own Lamb. God's lamb. We've had Moses' lamb. We've had Isaac's lamb. But now look at God's lamb. And that's Jesus Christ. So we have this yardstick here. He's got to be hung like the Romans crucified on a wooden cross. He's got to die exactly at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He's got to hang there. He's got to die. The sun must go out at noonday. He's got to be buried in a borrowed tomb. And he's got to stay there from Friday until Sunday morning. And he's got to get up with all power in his hand on Sunday morning. Now there are those of you who've given your life. Elijah Muhammad, he died five, six years ago. He's still in the grave. He's still in the grave. He's not the Christ. There are those of you who have followed this one and that one, this teacher and that teacher, and they have died. They are not the Christ. No one whose body is still in the grave is the Christ. But oh, I've come to tell you tonight that there is one who fulfills all of the prophecies of old. There is one that was born of a virgin and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. There is one whose mother was a virgin. There is one who spoke in parables. There is one that was baptized in Jordan. There is one that was crucified on Friday and rose on Sunday morning. There is one. Oh, thank God I know him. I said, thank God I know him. I know in whom I put my trust. I know that when you put Jesus in proper focus, he's more than man. He's son of God. He's more than man. He's a savior of the world. He's more than a religious leader. 
He's the hope of Judaism. He's the hope of Buddhism. He's the hope of Confucius. He's the hope of our law. He's the Son of God. God, rejoice tonight. Rejoice tonight. And we don't bow down to a dumb stature that has ears and cannot hear. We serve a risen Savior who has all power in his name. Those of you who are in your living room, wherever you are listening to me tonight, <laughs> Jesus in proper focus can come right now close to you. For he saves that I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And Jesus wants to save you. And if you've been looking at him as just a mere teacher, just another historical figure about whom historians have written, no wonder you're not saved because that's not saving faith. But ah, if you'll search out the evidence that I've given you tonight, and if you'll bow your head and if convenient, get close to the floor by bowing your knees. And maybe for the first time, the Lord God Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus will save. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. I want you to bow your heads and say, Jesus, I know that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's so important. That's so important. If he's just merely a teacher, he does not have saving power. But it is so important that you know that he's God's son sent into the world as our substitute to die and as our savior to rise. And he did ra rise. He was raised from the dead. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us and will be in you when you invite him to come into your life. Pray, pray, pray right now. Save me, Lord. Lord, save me. Lord, I acknowledge you as the Son of God, the Christ, the living Savior. And I invite you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me. Live in my life and do it now. And I thank you now. And when you pray like that, you've got him in focus. You have him in focus. You can ask what you will. Because you have him in proper focus. He's God. He's Savior. And he wants to save you now. Thank you, Dr. Hill. The word of God says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For whosoever, whosoever. oh, I love that verse. That means you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'd like to lead you in a little prayer of forgiveness mm. right now. And if you will pray this prayer with Dr. Hill. Okay. And I want all the Christians to pray it too, just to encourage those who don't know him. Mm. You have heard who the real Christ is tonight. Mm. You have seen a sharp and a beautiful and an in-focused picture drawn of this beautiful man mm. of whom there is no other like him. And if you will receive him now, he'll be your savior. Pray this prayer with me across America mm. right now. Oh God, oh God. God. I do believe, I do believe that, you that you sent your own blessed son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Your own precious son, your your own own precious son to be my savior. To be my savior. I open my heart. I open open my heart. And I confess with my mouth and and I confess confess with my mouth. the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. I believe his precious blood. I believe his precious blood. Cleanses me now. Cleanses me now. From every sin. From every sin. 
I renounce all other Christs. I renounce all other Christs. And I receive the true and the living Christ. And I receive the true and the living Christ. Now. Now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, give them now the power to become the sons yes, of the living yes, God. I bind you. the evil one in Jesus' name. He that would try to bring blindness and to snatch the good seed of the word, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. We are not ignorant of your devices, but the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of your strongholds. And we pull those strongholds down now in the name of Jesus Christ, and we command you to loose those whom the Spirit of God is calling this moment to faith and salvation in the name of Amen. Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Father, you said you'd bind on earth what we'd bind. You'd bind in heaven what we bind on earth. You'd loose in heaven what we lose on earth. We do it now in the name of Jesus. And all the church said, Amen. 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 Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Praise God. Keep calling. If you don't get through on the line, dial, as I said a hundred times. We want to hear your salvation. Oh, I've got the best news. Where did he go? <laughs> David, this will thrill you. It'll thrill everybody. A brother, John, from Terminal Annex Prison here in Los oh. Angeles, California, just phoned in and received Jesus as his Savior. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, said, please send a Bible and the study course. We will send it. We will send it. That made the headlines in heaven, yes, David. Yes, yes it yes. did. Hundreds more are calling right now. Call, receive Jesus. We want to send you a Bible, a new birth certificate with your name inscribed upon it and the date of your second birth. We'll send you a Bible study course, month's course. If you live in... L.A. somewhere, we'll send you to Pastor Hill's church. Yeah, you won't like it. Praise oh, God. Right. Praise God. I think somebody <laughs> just said, okay, you've probably got a new member over there, Pastor Hill. The phones are busy now, but keep dialing. I know you'll get through. David, sing a song as we prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion in a few moments. But right now, as you call to confess Christ as Savior, David Sapp is going to sing, Rest of My Life. Let's thank Pastor Hill for that mighty message. And David for singing the love of Jesus to us. is a story of shame, but the rest of my life I will honor God's name. Freely I drink from life's glittering cup, so deep in my sin. I could hardly look up Broken and spent To the Savior I cried Now the rest of my life We will walk side by side Part of my life To fall side oops, I bow Follow the crowd. 
is a story of shame, but the rest of my life I will honor God's name. Uh, David, stay there close. We want you to sing again in just a moment. But oh, we rejoice because Nanny from Los Angeles got saved. Claudette from Seaview, Washington received Christ. Brian from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Barbara from Aurora, Colorado. Joel from Los Angeles. And Frank from Santa Ana. And Joanne from Los Angeles. And John from Highland Park. Oh, they're calling in from all over, from Fort Lauderdale, from North Las Amen. Vegas. Thank God we're on the cable up there in Las Vegas. Newhall, California, Fontana, Palmdale, Venice, Lomita, my goodness, Carroll City, Florida, Glendale, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach. <laughs> Hallelujah, the world is finding Jesus. <laughs> Pastor, you told us how to know the real Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Praise God. Honey, have you got a little something you want to read just before David <coughs> sings again? And we let me say again in a little bit as the calls get on through and as people find Christ, we want to take plenty of time so that you can get through the confessing with your mouth. But then those of you that will prepare there in your home the elements of Holy Communion and together we're going to take uh, and break bread together and celebrate the death, the burial, and then the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So get ready to join in with us even there at home. And we'll be serving our little audience here in the studio. You know, I could never do justice <clears throat> the entire chapter that Papa Bilheimer wrote on Christ's dynamic victory, what he did for us. Mm. by not only dying on the cross, but going to hell for us. Mm. But Papa Bilheimer has written in this book, Destined for the Throne, I guess one of the greatest painted pictures of what literally happened on that day 2,000 years ago when the real Christ, <laughs> mm. the one born of the Virgin mm. Mary, the yes. one that lived that sinless life, Thank you, Jesus. And the one that was willing to die in my place and go to hell for me, what he did for me, and all he said for us to do was, would you just remember, remember. just remember what I did for you by partaking of the blood and the bread of my body. Would you just remember me? until I come again. Papa's made it so clear. I think David can sing about it. But maybe I'll read a little portion just Amen. before we Amen. partake. Before we... It is so beautiful. You should get Destined for the Throne by Paul E. Bilheimer and read it. I read the entire chapter over in Phoenix one night in Mother's house late at night. And I cried a towel for <laughs> I'd cried until the Kleenex box was empty, and I got me a towel and began to... It makes you fall in love with Jesus all over again to know what he did for us when he went to hell for you and for me. And we're going to remember what Jesus did Amen. for us tonight. Amen. I believe many of you will be healed Amen. as we come to the table of the Lord. You know, as a child growing up, I can remember Pastor Hill almost... We'd always celebrate Holy Communion once a month in my church. And mm -hmm. I can remember, you know, those fearful words from Corinthians that he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. And I, I remember as a young boy growing up in the church, I used to kind of dread, uh, you know, the day that we had Holy Communion because I knew some of the ornery things that I'd done. And I knew yes. that I needed uh, to ask forgiveness. But uh, I learned later in life that this table, you see, is where sin is taken care of. This table is where sickness is taken care of. So if you've sinned, if you're sick, if you're un under any kind of a burden tonight, 
You shouldn't run away from this table. You should run to this table because this is where Jesus takes care of it. Oh, when I learned that and when that broke upon me by the revelation of the Spirit of the living Christ, then with joy I come to this table. With joy I partake of this cup. Yes, we must examine ourselves. Yes, we must confess any sin, any known sin that we may have in our lives. Yes, we must ask the, for the cleansing of the blood. But here is the table where we do that. And if you can understand that and if that can get down in your spirit, then with great joy we can receive and partake together of this precious table of the Lord. And we're getting ready to do that in just a little bit. But David... They're still calling and the phones are still ringing. The lines are busy and oh, there's great rejoicing in heaven as new names are being written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Again, let me say, if you cannot get through, dial again. Please don't give up. Dial again and again and again. Honey, just before David sings one more song, who else it's is Dana coming? from Denver, 17, and Mary from Homestead, Florida. Millie from Florida. Mary... Here is uh, Esmeralda from Coulter, California. Just received Jesus. Stacy from Ventura, 23. So many still more. They come. Still calling. Still they come. Keep dialing. Keep calling. David, it's a good song. Keep on believing. We're going to do that right now as people call and as you sing. A lot of folks that have just received Jesus Christ they need the encouragement of this song. I've chosen to sing Keep On Believing. It's a song of, that I've written, of course, from my testimony of healing. But I begin to notice that people that were discouraged and people that had fear and people that were worried about the situations in the world, they need to find Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he spoke to Jairus these words before he actually got to the house and they saw the daughter raised from the dead. He said, Be not afraid but keep on believing. And I want to sing that for you this night. Keep on believing. Keep on believing in what you do for you. Just keep on believing. Don't give up. You see it through. Because it's not His way to leave all alone. Keep on believing the victory will come. Oh, the times when I'm tested I remember it's not his way to leave us on our own. He said he would never leave us. And he said, it will be true. There's nothing that he won't do. You just keep on believing your faith. Let's have that kind of faith tonight. Keep on believing in what He'll do for you. Reach out with me today. Keep on believing. Don't ever give up. He'll see you through. Because it's not His way to leave you all by yourself. Keep on believing, the victory will come. There are times when sickness comes with its pain. <laughs> but the prayer of faith will heal and the Lord will raise you up. That's what our Bible says. And the Word of God is true. What He said, He's going to do for you. You just keep on believing, because there's healing 
right now for you. I want you to reach out and take a hold of the hem of his garment and believe right now for your miracle. There's healing for you right now. Just keep on believing. Take a hold of the promises of God. Lay hold upon it and keep on believing. Don't you give up. He'll see you through. Cause it's not his way to leave all alone. He promised us. Hallelujah. Keep on believing. the prospect of physical suffering which brought the agony in the garden. Mm. That was nothing compared to the torture of his spirit. Mm. It was the anguish of a pure soul who knew no sin, mm. facing the injustice of being made sin, mm. of being so completely identified with sin as not only to forfeit the fellowship of his very own father, to, but to become the object of his father's loathing. This was no mere legal imputation of sin. Jesus was made sin. He became the very essence of sin by dying as a sin offering. He suffered the pollution of sin as if he had actually run the entire gamut of human transgression. He was adjusted guilty of the cumulative sin of mankind mm. and condemned to pay the full price mm. and completely mm. satisfied the demands of justice oh. against the combined sin of the entire world. <laughs> the temptation of Gethsemane was to refuse to drink the cup. The decision he had to make was whether he would retain the fellowship which he had had with the Father mm. before the world began, or whether he would accept this unjust yet genuine identification with mm. sin. It was no fictitious temptation, people. This was what <coughs> caused his soul to be exceeding sorrowful mm. even unto death. His unspeakable agony is reflected in that bloody sweat and in his prayer, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy wilt. It seems that here the peak of his agony was reached. If ever there was any doubt as to the outcome, it faded after this word, never the less. Upon that word hung the fate of the entire world. With that decision, the crisis passed. He had accepted your cup. After Gethsemane, what followed was almost anticlimactic. The judgment hall with its scourging and crowns of thorn. The torturous Via Della Rosa leading to Golgotha. The actual crucifixion. These were like the calm following the storm. Until the actual moment of forsaking. In that one moment, as the hounds of hell were baying for his blood, and as the Father hid his face, the heart that could endure no more was broken. And he bowed his head and he died for you. That's my Jesus. Honey, it goes.
goes on, but I think maybe here we should partake. Maybe I should bring it more later. I have known for a long time that it was there at that rock of agony where Jan and I have knelt many times that the real battle is won. There we see clearly defined the human and the divine nature of Jesus Christ. The human nature cries out, Father, if it be possible. But the divine answers back, nevertheless, yes. not my will, but thine yes, be done. Yes. There in that great titanic struggle, I love the way Papa oh. Bill Heimer puts it. On that one word hung the fate of the entire human race. Nevertheless, not my will, what but thine word. be done. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Jesus simply says, Will you remember that night? Will you remember that mock trial? Will you remember that all forsook me? Will you remember that they planted a crown of thorns upon my head? Will you remember that I carried a cross to Calvary? Will you remember that I died? Will you just remember? I want to read just a few verses of Scripture and then I'll ask Pastor Hill to add anything he would wish to add and then sanctify and pray over the elements that we will partake of that bring to our remembrance the suffering and the passion of our precious Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, we read, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I would say to those of you that know Jesus as Savior, look into your heart. Is there's something there that the Holy Spirit is dealing with? If so, bring it to this table of the Lord. Is there some bitterness there? Is there an unforgiving spirit? Has someone hurt you? Is the wound still there? Bring it to this table of the Lord. Have the physicians told you that there is no hope? Bring your case to this table of the Lord. The great physician is here, and he will heal you, and he will touch you. And there's a little woman who pressed through the crowd and touched just the hem of his garment. That issue of blood immediately dried up, and she was made whole as virtue went out of the body of our precious Savior. That same virtue is available today to touch you, if you will but reach out and receive it. We're being served the elements. Our counselors will be partaking. Our little audience here, I trust in your home, you have now prepared the elements and are ready to receive of the table of the Lord. Pastor Hill, share anything from your heart and then consecrate the elements. I think it's so important to repeat again what Jan has read for us. That when Jesus died on Calvary, the sins of all men of all ages, placed on just him. Not the soft sins, but the sins of the most vile was placed on him. 
and he died. He was made sin. He died. I think it should also be remembered that that's why the word the Lord's Supper has significance. <clears throat> because in order for there to be a supper, something has died. Yes. Something has died. And he said, take, this is my body, and eat. And at supper you eat. And so in one side of the picture there is this gloomy, almost picture that you would not want to see where the Son of God bears all of the sins of all men. But then he says, through it, there's another thing that happens at supper. We live. Yes, yes. We live. That's right. Every time we eat, we get strength. And so it's almost uh, an inhuman thing to think that from the very death of Jesus, we live. Just like from the very death of cattle and sheep and chickens, we live. From the very death of Jesus, we live. And we come to this supper not because we are able, but because he's able. Not because we are clean, but because he cleanses. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, again it is our privilege to recreate in our minds and hearts your own son's sacrifice. And as John hollered loudly, behold the Lamb of God. Behold God's Lamb. And we are amazed that your lamb, your sacrifice, is your own son. And yet we live. And we hear you say we are accepted in the beloved. We come now fellowshipping together, but thinking about Calvary. Bless thou these elements that they may be used to remind us again that Jesus did die. And because he died, we live. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We take now the bread, the symbol of his precious broken body. For he said, when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat this is my body which is broken for you shall we partake together and thank him as we do praise you Lord praise you Lord Jesus we thank you for that broken body by which we are healed thank you Jesus the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me shall we remember his precious blood as we partake Praise you, Lord Jesus. Let's just worship him for a moment. Praise Thank you for your goodness and mercy and grace. Hallelujah. Perfect sacrifice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God. Pastor Hill, hundreds have phoned in from all over the country tonight. Who are suffering in body, who are hurting. Who doctors have said there is no hope. Would you just lead us in a prayer as we agree right now? 
Oh, hope for those and hope where there is no hope this seen. Oh, great physician who can just will out of the riches of your grace, out of the abundance of your mercy, every case, Lord, we lift to you. Yes, Lord, we agree. Whatever the case, whatever the need, whatever the burden, whatever the healing that's needed in our bodies and anybody's body Amen. that looks to you by faith particular, that have you right now in focus, they see you right now as Jesus, Savior, Lord, Christ, Emmanuel, everyone who has you right now in focus, touch Lord Jesus. Yes. Thank you for your healing power. In Jesus' name, amen. Already many healing testimonies are coming in. We want to hear about that, but please keep calling. We have a few more minutes. David, I think there's time for you to sing another song or two. There's one very special one that I wish you'd sing. It talks about that that we've just partaken of. I've been to Calvary. So if you'll slip over in a moment to the music set. We'll have David Sapp sing another great song for us. And if you couldn't get through on the phone, do it now. Amen. Call through now. Tell us what great things God hath done. You remember when Jesus healed the ten lepers? They went their way, and they were grateful, and they were thankful. But how many returned to give him thanks? Only one returned to give thanks. Give him praise for what he's done in your life. Here is Ray Zacharias. That's a good Bible name Amen. from Denver, Colorado. Called in for prayer for healing of his body from the scourge of cancer. He is saying, I thank the Lord that I have been completely healed. Praise the Lord. God is still in the healing business. Yes, he is. And Ray from Denver, Colorado is praising the Lord. Here's someone from Torrance healed from tumors in the body, uh, in the adrenaline gland. And the tumors, they couldn't even operate upon them, and they have been healed by the power of Jesus Christ. Pressure in the ear, gone, as a counselor prayed for me on the telephone. Laid my ear on the pillow. For a long time there'd been this awful sound, and as the counselor prayed, heat went all over my body. The pain left, the ear is healed, and she's praising God. Vera from Chino, California. Oh, so many are calling. Vera's Virginia's praising God. Her husband accepted the Lord after much prayer. Keep praying for those unsaved loved ones. God will hear and answer prayer. Yes, he will. Keep calling right now as David Sapp sings again that beautiful song, I've been to Calvary. Mm -hmm. We love you tonight. Keep calling. Keep trusting. Keep praising the Lord. I've never traveled far around the world I've never seen the many thrills and sights unfurled But I have taken the journey of journeys for me Of Calvary's mountain there my sin to see I've been to Calvary I can say I've seen the Lord I've been to Calvary through the witness of his word each day at Calvary what a three Just to know that this Savior is mine. Not too long ago, I visited the Holy Land, and 
And I remember that time there in the garden tomb area where we had communion. We walked over to the place where we viewed the hill of the skull, Golgotha. And as I remember looking up that day at Mount Calvary, I remembered what Jesus had, did, had done for me, of how he suffered the shame and the agony and even the death just for me. Now, you may never get to take a trip to those sacred places there in Jerusalem, but you must, listen to me, you must make that spiritual journey. You must kneel in the shadow of the cross and bow your heart at the altar of forgiveness. You see, that's the most important journey of all. I'm glad I've been to Calvary. I walk that Calvary hill where Jesus trod. I saw him hanging there, the Son of God. With tear dimmed eyes, I knelt and prayed, Jesus, hear my plea. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm glad I've been to Calvary. I've been to Calvary. I can say I've seen the Lord. I've been to Calvary through the witness of His Word. The Savior is mine. Just to know, just to be, just to know that the Savior is mine. Well, let's check and see who else has been to Calvary. How about Amen. Steve from Omaha, Nebraska, 19 years old, David. Amen. By the way, can you sing, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand? Uh, that song just does something way down deep in my spirit. Yes, honey, tell us a little bit about David's beautiful record album. Keep on believing in one day at a time, David Sapp. Isn't that good? <laughs> And we love his singing. So glad to have him with us. Get his record. If they don't have it in your Bible bookstore, just ask them to get it. Or you can call us here and we'll give your name to David and he can send you yes. his record album. Amen. Steve from Omaha, Anna from Melville, Michigan, Great. Tony from Fort Worth, Texas, Gene from Fishkill, New York, just got uh, saved, 47, that's where our brand new studio is going to be, mm. they're working on it right now, Carmen from Poughkeepsie, New York, Jesse from Middletown, New York, Barbara from Denver, Colorado, Tony from Newhall, California, Donald from Lexington, Oklahoma, Arlene from Los Angeles, Mary from Tahunga, California, Ken from Davie, Florida, Suzanne from from Torrance, California, Mark from Omaha, Nebraska again, Doreen from Phoenix, Tanya from Phoenix, Julia from Phoenix, B from Sun City, Kevin from Phoenix, Cherry from Phoenix, Curtis from L.A. Pastor, you told them about the real Jesus and they yes. believed it. Hallelujah! I'm getting excited. At least, what, two, three hundred have received the Lord and I, they're still pouring in. Keep dialing, keep calling right now. Are we ready to see, sing, David? Oh, listen, if you haven't seen him, look now. You can see him right now if you'll only look for Pastor Hill painted for us a beautiful, clear picture of the real Jesus. Stephen saw him that day as the stones were falling and as he was dying. He saw Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Sing it from your heart, David, as people continue to call confessing Jesus as their Savior and then we'll have a final word of prayer with you in a moment. David, we love you. Sing it from your heart. Once a man named Stephen 
preached about the Lord. Folk were saved and folk were healed as they heard the word. Now Satan did not like it, and soon he had his craft. And as he was tried, they heard Stephen cry aloud. I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. I see Jesus yonder in the promised land. Now work is over. Now I'm coming to me. I see Jesus standing, waiting for me. As the stones fell on me, beating out his life, Stephen knew he'd soon be through with all. Like the master with a heart so true, he prayed, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Now work is over, now I'm coming to me. I see Jesus standing, waiting for me. Through the gates of glory and down the streets of gold, hallelujah. March to hero of the Lord, soldier brave and true. Now when he met the master at the great white throne, I believe he smiled and he said, listen what he said, Stephen, welcome I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. I see Jesus yonder in the promised land. For work is over, it's all over, and now I'm coming to be. I see Jesus. Standing, waiting for me. Hallelujah. I believe we can see Jesus tonight, don't you? Hallelujah. Table today, and uh, I would like first of all to thank both of you, Pastor Hill and David Sant, for being with us tonight. Pastor, where is Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church? Well, it's right in the heart of South Central, 50th and Hooper. Just uh, come down the Harbor Freeway to Vernon, go east for 13 blocks, come up for seven blocks. You can't hardly miss 50th and Hooper. Man, do you preach like that at Mount Zion all the time? Oh. Much longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, I can't wait to get that Holy Beamer back there. And on November the 29th, 29th. 29th Jan and I'll be there, and we'll be having a great time with Pastor Hill and all of the wonderful folk there. 
and Jerry Falwell will be the very special speaker and guest there. And David, uh, where where you go from here? You, you well, we are on our way back to Florida. We've been down there for two weeks, and we came home for a couple of weeks of rest, and, and we're having revivals. Uh, we were in the Tampa area, and they used to get TBN, and I told them to call your cable company. We want a TBN back in, in, yeah. in the Tampa area. Well, but God is moving. Every, every one of our revivals, we have, we have had people b baptized in the Holy Spirit. While I'm singing, I've had people healed. Uh, we had a lady the other night, we were praying at the end of the service, I just prayed for her, and, and I didn't know why she had come up. I'd ask, and she said she had pain in her back. But as she was slain in the spirit, she got up from there. Her husband reached down to see what was wrong. He checked her pulse. He didn't know what had happened to her, you know. He'd never been in church much before. And so, but as the Lord touched her, she said the pain left her. When she, you know, I, I don't mind people being slain in the spirit when God touches them. And, and they're changed when they get up from the floor. Well, there you go. That's, that, we're seeing miracles. I believe God is calling the church to be instrumental in miracles. Not just a, an evangelist here and there, but I believe as the church, you're talking about the awakening, the revival coming. We're going to see miracles happen in these churches. And I'm believing God for it. Hallelujah. Where do you go from here? Is there anything we can tell the people uh, where you will be so that many of them will want to go, I know? Uh, we're going to be in Carlsbad, California, October 17th through the uh, 20th, or well, Sunday through Wednesday, at the uh, Full Gospel uh, church there. <laughs> uh, it's Assembly of God Church, but I don't know the exact name of it. Carlsbad. I forgot. In Carlsbad, California. Well, we get into Carlsbad, and so good, good. We'll a lot of the friends will, will see you there. All right. We've got 30 seconds to say good night. Any final we'll little words? We'll see everyone in Oklahoma City <gasps> next, next week. week. Yes, and our yes. special guest Monday night is going to be Kenneth Copeland. Who? A newcomer. Kenneth Yes, I think I've heard of him. Hi, from Oklahoma City, and there's so many beautiful people. Oh, we've had a wonderful time. We've heard the word preached and sung. We've partaken of the table of the Lord. I've been lifted and edified and blessed, and I know you have too. 24-hour-a-day television goes right on. Keep calling. We'll stay by the phones as long as they ring. Good night. God love you. We love you. And remember, let everything that has breath just praise the Lord. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, call a prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Our 24-hour prayer partner line is 714-731-1000. If you'd like an audio cassette of Praise the Lord, please write and ask for program 107-82. That's 107-82. If possible, tuck in a love gift to help defray the cost of the tape ministry. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today. Praise the Lord. P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Paul and Jan would like to thank you for your prayers and financial support. You keep us on the air. Thank you. This is Jim McClellan saying, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. This program was brought to you by the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout the United States of America.